Okay, welcome to my talk. So, similar to Benham, I'm also an electrical engineer, not a biologist, not even an information theorist. Uh, I'm, my area of expertise is uh, communications. And so what I'm interested in is uh, building man-made, or let's say designing and eventually hopefully building man-made uh, molecular communication systems and uh, try to see what are the obstacles that we have to overcome to do this. And the particular topic I'm talking about uh, here today is the mitigation of intersymbol interference. And the short term of this is ISI, and this is the ISI that Toby was not talking about uh, in the morning, right? He mentioned that there was two different types of ISI. So this is the one that he was uh, you know, not talking about. And this is joint work, uh, or really mostly the work, I have to say, of my student Adam Noel, who unfortunately could not be here today for family reasons, and my colleague uh, Karen Chang, and she's more the biology per person in this team. So <clears throat> first, I give you a brief overview of what I understand under molecular communications, and in particular, in the context, in this context, what is endosome interference. Then um, I present the model that we use. So obviously, since we want to design something, the model that models that we use, they are very simple, much more simple than the models that we've seen today here throughout the other presentations. And then um, I talk about the mechanism that we use to mitigate actually endosymbol interference in the system. Uh, and show you some analytical and simulation results and uh, conclude. So we see molecular communications as a means to enable uh, nanomachines, whatever that is, uh, to communicate with each other in environments where traditional forms of communications are not possible either because the environment is not suitable, like you know, in, a, in a fluid medium, for example, or uh, for size reasons, just because, uh, you know, as we heard, I think, in another talk, uh, the frequencies that we would have to use because of the size of the antennas that we would have to use may not be um, appropriate. So then, of course, there's already, there are already many um, molecular communication systems implemented uh, in natural biological systems. And what we try to do is we try to learn from these natural systems and see how we can harness some of the techniques that are there uh, for our purpose. And to build such systems, uh, we try to identify what are the performance bottlenecks, so what problems do we have to overcome in order to make this work, and also to develop some techniques then to and yes, there are many uh, natural uh, systems that use molecular communication, such as uh, bacteria when they do quorum sensing, for example, or um, as you know better than me, uh, the cells in tissue, they communicate via molecular communications, and they use different forms of molecular communications to do so. So I listed here three options, three, four options that we possibly uh, have to implement uh, man-made molecular communication systems. So one would be free diffusion, another one might be gap junctions, then the molecular motors or bacterial motors. And people have worked on all of these areas in an effort to build man-made systems. Here I will concentrate on the first option, the free diffusion since uh, this does not require any additional infrastructure, if you don't count the transmitter and the receiver, of course. And um, also, you don't need any external energy uh, if you don't count the energy that you need to produce the molecules, right? So no additional energy is needed. So this, uh, the, the system model that we have is very simple, right? So let's see what I try to do here. So we have a transmitter, we have a receiver, and uh, the transmitter has a binary message to send to the receiver, and we use for this what we call an engineering on-off key. So if we want to transmit a binary one, then our transmitter releases A molecules, whatever those molecules may be, right? So generic uh, signaling molecules. And um, if, no, if a zero is to be sent, then no molecules are transmitted, right? So on-off one of the other. Then these molecules, they diffuse in the medium, and some of them uh, arrive at the receiver, and we assume that the receiver somehow can count at a certain time the molecules that uh, are you know, in its neighborhood, let's say. 
and I will make this a little bit more precise what our assumptions are a little bit later. Um, so with this, there are many problems, but I just uh, try to focus on those that are related to the environment, you know, not necessarily to the transmitter and receiver, just the diffusive process. So first of all, in a real environment, there may be flow, right, that prevents the molecule from actually reaching the destination if it goes into the wrong direction. Then these types of molecules may already be used by other processes, so this would be noise in our system and would degrade the performance. Then, of course, uh, in a practical system, the receiver uh, has to know when to expect the transmission. So there has to be some sort of synchronization involved, and um, this is also not really solved. And then we as engineers, of course, we're very used to uh, other types of communication systems, so wireless or optical communication systems, and to the type of processing that we can do in these systems. We know what kind of processing can be done, but the types of processing that can be done in a, let's say, biological system may be vastly different from that, right? So we need to develop different techniques. And finally, as I will show more in detail a little bit later, there may be interesting interference that causes a degradation if we want to transmit multiple uh, sumos in succession, right? And in this talk, I will focus on mainly the interesting interference but we will also allow for flow in our environment, and we try at least to take into account these limited uh, processing uh, capabilities. So in my previous example, if you measure the concentration of the molecules that arrive at the receiver over time, and you assume that you know, these Na molecules are released at time zero, then what you would observe would look somehow like this. So at the beginning, you don't observe any molecules, since it takes some time for the first molecules to arrive at the receiver. Then you have this increase, and then after that, again, a slow decrease over time. Now, there are two degradations. First of all, of course, you release many more molecules than arrive at the receiver because of the diffusion in all directions. That's one issue. Another issue is if you see the slow decay here over time. So if you were to send a second pass after a certain time, then these two pulses, they overlap. And this overlap is what we call an engineering intersymbol interference. So the two neighboring symbols, they interfere with each other, and this ultimately will lead to a performance degradation. So will lead to a worse performance, as we'll see later. Yes? Question, does your receiver remove the molecules when they get there, or do they, are they, is it catch and release? Yes, in, in our model it's catch and release, but it doesn't make a big difference whether uh, it removes them or not, right? Because, um, the, I mean, those are just the ones that are that you detect, but of course in the environment, in the surrounding environment, there are many more than this, right? So the ones that you observe at any uh, given time, right, those may be different molecules. Right, so if I count here, let's say, right, then the molecules that I count here are not the same, right, since they are still diffusing towards the receiver, right? So the ones that I counted before, they will diffuse somewhere else, right, and new molecules come in. So even if I removed them, I would not solve this problem. But in our model, no, we don't remove them. Okay, so this is, now you know what indecent interference is, and now I try to make my model a bit more precise and uh, also answer the question that was just posed. Um, so as I said, we assume a very simple model. So for the most time, we assume a point source here, so as a singular point that releases zero or Na information molecules, and these Na molecules are uh, released instantly. So in one time instant, boom, they're just there, right? Which is of course physically not po possible, but as we'll see in a little bit for modeling reasons, we make this assumption. Um, the receiver we model as fully transparent and passive, and we just assume that it counts the molecules that pass through it uh, at a given time, and it can count m times in one symbol interval. Right? So that's the models that we used, as I said, very simple models for the transmitter and the receiver. Uh, for the environment, we assume a three-dimensional environment, and we assume that there's diffusion, but there also can be flow in the environment. And the flow we assume is the simplest flow you can assume, namely uniform flow uh, with fixed velocities in each uh, direction as opposed to laminar flow or turbulent flow, which would be more difficult to model. Now, yes? Um, 
the symbol period is basically the time between when the transmitter sends the next set of next pulse. pulse. Yes. Yes. Batch of. Uh, yes. But the information is also non pulse actually. Yes, pulse and non-pulse, exactly, right? So it may or it might not, yeah. But that's, the symbol period is fixed, and the information is encoded in the amplitude, not in the time difference, yeah. How is the form if you're talking about that? Okay, so lamina is basically that, um, right? So if you, let's say you have a pipe, right, and it's lamina flow, then your distribution of the velocities looks somehow like this, right? So here you have zero velocity, and here it's larger. Uniform means that, okay, it's the same everywhere, right? Except there was no here. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, so the, as you know better than me, the um, concentration uh, at a given point, uh, the concentration at a given point at a given time is governed uh, by this fixed the second law. C is the concentration here, D, uh, the proportional coefficient, is the diffusion coefficient. And there's a very rich, rich, rich literature on this fixed second law since it appears in many different uh, fields uh, of physics. But even for simple environments and simple initial conditions, um, closed form solutions are not known. So for the case where closed form solutions are known, I show you here too. So this is my impulsive point source. So I have this impulsive point source, say, at the origin, and it emits these Na molecules, and the environment is infinite in all directions. And in this case, if you are r, you know, distance r away from this point source, the concentration that we will observe is this one here over time. So the further you're away, obviously, the less uh, molecules you will observe, so the lower the concentration, right? And here's T and here's T, and we'll see later how this, you know, having T here and T here, how this affects actually our interstellar interference. Now, even if I make this model just a little bit more complicated or a little bit more realistic by assuming that I have a spherical source of radius R ox, right? That's the radius of the source. And again, an infinite environment and instant release, then this equation already, you know, looks a little bit more ugly. And less easy to handle. Of course, if you make our ops here very small, then you're back to this model here, I guess, as it should be. But for this reason, here in this talk, I will assume this um, concentration over time and space, and knowing, of course, that this is an approximation for any real system, right? Flow can easily be incorporated in this model, so uh, if we have still the impulsive source, but we have this uniform flow, then you can correct this term here just by introducing an effective radius, which uh, has the coordinates x, y, z, z, right, and then the corresponding velocities. So we still can use the same, same equation. Okay, so how do we do now? How do we deal with interstellar interference, right? So this is the phenomenon we have. We have this overlap. How can we overcome it? Uh, you can see here in my concentration, right? So this is this. The concentration that I just showed, this describes these uh, dashed lines. And you can see for large times t, right, if t becomes large here, then this term here becomes basically 1, right, this exponential. And we have this decay with t over 3 over 2, right, so which is a polynomial decay, which is very slow, which is why we have these long tails and the interstellar interference. Now, one option to overcome this, of course, would be to just uh, decrease our data rate. So we just pulse you know, we just um, space those two pulses further apart, then, you know, we can have less interference that would serve the purpose, but we decrease the data rate, which is not what we may want to do. So then, since I'm a, a communication engineer, right, the next thing is, okay, let's see how this is solved in a classical communication system, right, in wireless communications or in uh, optical communications. And there, we know very well how to deal with this, so we may use maximum likelihood sequence estimation, so it's a sort of an equalizer, and this is the best you can do, so this gives you the optimum, the best possible performance, and you can implement it with you know, reasonable complexity using this algorithm. Or, if this is too high a complexity, you can resort to linear or nonlinear filtering, which then results in what we call linear equalization or decision feedback equalization. But, uh, and this has been done, so people have looked at these uh, types, have use these techniques also in the context of molecular communication. But um, we believe that this may be a little bit too complex and it's unlikely that nature uh, solves the problem this way. Right? So therefore, um, we 
took one step back and we tried to see if we can borrow some of the concepts that nature uses to deal with this. Yes? Can you do that at all? I mean, scale sums, because it's sum linear. Sorry? The, the tail sums, right? I mean, inter symbol interference. The yes. Sum of all those tails. Um, at the end, does it get does it, does it Does it get small? Uh, well, does it grow? I think it decays with. If it decayed with 1 over t, right, if you summed, you would get infinity. But it, uh, since it decays faster than 1 over t, I think it would converge, right? The series would converge. Right? This is sine x over x, right? I mean, with, if you have well, the offset, it does it's not converge. Yes, sure. if it's just a little bit more, then it's enough to, to converge. But still, I think, yeah, you're, you're right, of course, that you have very long tails, right? That you have to deal with. OK, so one option would be. Uh, to use, I mean, one thing that what nature uses to restrict this is gap junctions, right? So with this, you restrict the movement of your molecules and um, you avoid these tails. But this would require no infrastructure, which is what we didn't want to, to have in the first place, right? So this would somehow defeat our, our purpose. And another uh, mechanism that nature uses, it uses enzymes to reduce excess molecules. And uh, for example, in the neuromuscular junction, it uses enzymes to degrade neurotransmitters in order to be able to signal faster, right, or to signal again. And exactly this is the mechanism then that we also want to use in our system. Yes. Why not just put a threshold, you know, put Make a threshold the high enough so that, you know, when the next spike comes, so that like, look, obviously, you know, just put a threshold there. Yes, you, you, you can do this. You can make your threshold adaptive, right? You know that you before uh, detected this signal, so yeah. you should make your threshold higher. But um, this does not completely do away with the problem, right? And um, we, we looked at this as well, right? So at this adaptive threshold, we looked at this as well. And so basically, you just put your threshold on the second most lowest line there, and then if you exceed that, that means your one is there. Of right. course, I mean, I mean, what you observe, this, this is the average, right? So you observe a sample, right? So what you observe is noisy. Right? So what I show here, this is just the average pulse, right? But of course, well, so you have to uh, this is noisy, right? so this is a noisy pulse, right? So yeah, so yeah. Which is how you want to do it, basically. But, yes, but you can do it. Yeah, I mean, that's, we, we also looked at this, but that's not right. Right, so we introduce these enzymes into our environment and we assume that they are uniformly distributed in the environment, right? Again, for simplicity reasons. And um, then our molecules are released, right? Our A molecules are released. And if they come close enough to an enzyme, they react. And this reaction is described by this uh, um, Pialis Menten uh, mechanism. So basically, if the A molecule and the enzyme or the substrate and the enzyme, if they're close enough to each other, then with some probability uh, they bind, and then again with some probability uh, they unbind, and with some other probability uh, some uh, reaction happens and the enzyme degrades the molecule <coughs> into an AP molecule, and this AP molecule can no longer be counted at the receiver. Right? So we assume that the receiver is uh, sufficiently sensitive to the type of molecule, so it cannot observe or not count the AP uh, molecules. Um, but so the enzyme stays. Sorry? But the enzyme is still active. Yes, the enzyme can be reused, right? Can be reused many times. Many times yes. And um, so now we, we have even a more difficult problem than before because now we have two effects basically. We have the diffusion and we have the reaction. So we get a set of three coupled uh, differential equations, right, for the concentration of E of the enzyme of the concentration of A and uh, this product. And um, for this, we you know, could not find, I mean, we are interested in analytical solutions, so you could solve it somehow numerically, and I think um, Rudy is talking about this a little bit more. But here we were just inter interested in the first order effects, so therefore um, we are looking for simple closed form solutions and resort to approximations. And there are different types of approximations you can make, right? So one is you can say that basically um, this one here, this reaction here, this back reaction happens with much lower probability than this reaction. So basically they don't separate again. Or there are other approximations you can make, but they all lead in the end basically to a model like this for the concentration. And this is no approximation. And this looks exactly the same as what we had before. Right? So it's exactly the same expression, except that we have this additional red term here. 
And then this k depends on what kind of approximation you make a little bit, but in a sense it's a function of k1, so this one reaction constant, and your enzyme concentration. So these two factor in there. And what we see now is that with this additional term, we have an exponential decay. So for large type height, you know, large t now, the decay is no longer polynomial, the decay becomes exponential. And graphically, this is shown here, right? So this dashed line was my old curve, right? Where it slowly decays, and this one here is now with the enzyme, and you have the much faster decay. And this again works for with or without Q. Are you seeing, are you yes. seeing the enzyme injected, or is it a pervasive property of the well, I mean, this is, depends, I mean, we, we just studied them, right? So, I mean, how they get there, right? So maybe they're already there, or no, we no, inject them. the practical question. The theoretical question is that they're, they're throughout the medium. Yes, they're, they're uniformly distributed problem. in the medium, yes. We also looked at, you know, making it basically say, we, we emit them at a certain time from here, so they have a non-uniform distribution, and uh, we could simulate this. We have a particle-based simulator, and there's not much uh, to be gained, but you cannot really analyze it anymore. So, so you change the channel. That's what I wanted to say exactly. So this is what we talked about yesterday, right? So instead of uh, basically uh, adapting the receiver or the transmitter, which we do in classical communications here, we actually change the channel, right? And nature also does this, right? So they actually change the channel uh, in order to adapt it to, to the environment, right? Exactly. Um, so now we could use this in two ways, right? That the pauses are shorter. One way would be to simply signal at the same frequency, right, with the same frequency, and then we avoid the interference. If we can afford some interference, then we can just signal faster, so we can increase the data rate, right, if we can live with the interference. Those are our options. Now, before I show you some results, um, I just tell you a little bit more about our uh, detector. And again, in a real system, of course, uh, the receiver, in some sense, you know, would either absorb the molecules with some biochemical uh, process, or hold the molecules briefly, and then some reaction would happen, right? Something along these lines. But this is difficult to model, and therefore we resort to, you know, again, a very simple model, since we're mainly interested in the transmission process, less in the, you know, I mean, at, at least at the moment. So what we assume is what I said before: an ideal passive and fully transparent receiver that just counts the molecules that pass through it at a given time, and it can take m samples per bit interval. So that's our assumption. And then it adds those samples up, so n a ops, those are the samples, so the molecules that we observe inside the receiver at a given time, and it, set, it sums up all the samples in one uh, bit or simple interval, and it can possibly weight them. So these are weights that we can choose, basically. And if you're above a threshold, then we say this was a one. If we're below the threshold, then we say it's a zero. And this was somehow motivated, I mean, this weighted sum detector was somehow motivated by uh, neurons that can sum the inputs from the synapses and then fire when a certain threshold is exceeded. So that's the, the motivation a little bit for this. Um, the weights, so if we can, we assume we can choose them. <coughs> so if you choose the weights equal, to the expected number of molecules, then you get something like a matched filter, right? So this would be one option. And a simpler option, of course, would be to just assume uh, that we have equal weights for all uh, samples. Now to the results. So we have two types of results in each figure. One is analytical, so we analyze this uh, system fully, basically at least the approximation of it, right? And um, uh, thereby, we assume that the received molecules at the receiver are also distributed, which is an approximation but holds if we have enough uh, molecules. And we assume that consecutive samples that we take at the receiver are independent. Now, this is an assumption that does not hold if you take too many samples because the same molecules will still linger around in the receiver and you will count them several times. Right? So this is approximation. And the effect of this will be seen in our results. And then um, our analysis includes the diffusion, the flow, the molecular degradation, and also we could model exter include external noise, which I will not emphasize here. <coughs> and then we compare this with simulation results that we get from a particle-based uh, stochastic simulator, where we model the diffusion as a three-dimensional biased random walk because of the flow. And um, the reaction is modeled probabilistically, so if the molecule and the enzyme are within their binding radius, then the 
you know, with a certain probability, something happens basically. Uh, so those are two two different models, and hopefully they give us similar results. Just to check that you know, at least it makes sense and within our model. So uh, the first result that I show you, we studied this uh, this the effect of this molecule degradation, and. Uh, I mean, the numbers are not that important, but just for the sake of completeness, so we assume that our transmitter can instantly release 5,000 A molecules for a binary one. And the distance between receiver and transmitter is 300 nanometer, and the diameter of the receiver is 90 uh, nanometer. And in this case, our receiver only takes one sample, right? So this is the, the simplest case. And you see here the bit error, the, the error rate. So <coughs> this is the probability that you detect a transmitted bit wrongly at the receiver right? <coughs> over the decision threshold. And of course, you're mostly interested in the decision threshold that gives you the best performance. Right? Now, if we don't use enzymes and we use a bit interval of 120 uh, microseconds, then you get this type of curve where the dashed line is the um, analytical result and the markers are from our simulations. And um, now, if you add the enzymes, then you can either keep the signaling interval the same, and this gives you a lower error rate, right? So you can improve performance because you have less uh, interference. Of course, you need a lower decision threshold because fewer molecules will arrive, because more are eaten away. Or if you're happy with the performance from before, then you can signal faster and you can increase your um, data rate, right? Decrease the, the bit interval. So this is the effect of molecule degradation. And then we looked at the effect of the number of samples <coughs> per bit interval. So this is the bit error probability again over the number of samples that you take. And we compare three different receivers here. First, this um, uh, blue lines are for the maximum likelihood receiver. So this is a theoretical optimum. This is the best you can do, but may not be you know, implementable. And you can see for this maximum likelihood receiver, whether you add enzymes, this is one or not, doesn't make a big difference because this is another way of dealing with the interference, <coughs> right? So it's not that crucial. However, the other curves here for our weighted sum detector, doesn't matter if you use, maximum, if you use a matched filter as the black line or uh, equal weight as the um, red line. The adding enzymes is crucial. If you don't add enzymes, you get a very poor performance. If you add enzymes, you get a significantly better performance. And last but not least here, you see <coughs> that the theory and the simulation is start to uh, deviate here at this point for if you take many samples. And this is exactly the effect that I described before, because in our analysis, we assume that the consecutive samples are independent, which they are not. But in our simulation, of course, this effect is included, and therefore uh, we get a poorer performance from the simulation than what we would predict from the analysis. Right? So this is uh, somewhat expected. And the last effect that I want to show you is that of flow. So here again, we have the error rate versus the flow. And uh, the flow here is in the direction from the transmitter to the receiver. So if it's a positive value, it's in this direction. If it's a negative value, it's in the opposite direction. So it carries the molecules away from the receiver. And we use here a normalized flow. And <coughs> normalization one means that the mean displacement by the flow is the same as that by diffusion. So if it's one, this means that diffusion and flow have approximately the same effect. If it's larger than one, then the flow dominates. If it's smaller than one, then the diffusion uh, dominates the effect. So what do you see, we see here? Let's look at uh, m equal to five samples, let's say, right? So you can see that a positive flow from the transmitter to the receiver has a positive effect. And so the error rate here goes down. We make fewer errors. And this is due to the fact, of course, that you can count more molecules. Before they can diffuse away, they're carried to your receiver, so you will observe more, right? On the, because the flow is in the direction of the, of the receiver. If this goes too fast, so if your flow is too fast, then those molecules, they will fly by your receiver before you have a chance to count them. And that's why the curves here go up again. Right? If you have a flow in the negative direction, then generally that's not good. But if you take enough samples, then you can see here there's a small positive effect for a very small flow in the wrong direction. And this is because this flow helps you to overcome indecimal interference. Right? So 
First, of course, it prevents the molecules to get to receiver, but some will arrive there, but then they will not linger around there and cause intersomal interference. They will be carried away by this flow again. So that's why you can have here possibly a small, small positive effect. All right, so this brings me to my uh, conclusion and future work. So we tried to come up with a very simple model for uh, this uh, reaction diffusion with flow in a uh, man-made uh, molecular communication system. We could see that intersomal interference can have a severe impact on the performance, and enzymes may be an appropriate uh, mechanism to overcome this intersomal interference. Flow may or may not be beneficial, right? It depends on uh, which direction it goes. Taking more samples is always beneficial, even if those samples are uh, not independent. And the next step for us is basically to validate some of this work experimentally. So I'm currently in the process of writing a grant application with some colleagues from biology uh, that believe that at least some of these things uh, can be measured in a, in a real system, or in a real model. And then yeah, there's some other things that are more on the theoretical side. So the most important one probably is the parameter estimation. So throughout this talk, I always assume that we have this per that we know perfectly what our you know concentration looks like. In any real system, of course, it will completely will look completely different, and you have to have some mechanism to estimate the shape, right, or a robust design. And yeah, this concludes my talk. Thank you very much. Is uniform, yeah. It's simply present. So we looked at the case space, we looked at some sort of modulation basically, uh, releasing them at a certain time from the receiver, let's say, right, so that you have a higher concentration around this receiver. But then, of course, they will also uh, diffuse away, and there's not much difference. So we, we didn't see much gain compared to having a uniform distribution in the simulations, right? And analytically, it's of course very difficult to, to model this. I mean, uh, just, just to You mean to actually also release the enzymes at the same time from the transmitter line? Yeah, in other words, you have like one pose that's releasing reaction, the other pose that's releasing the enzyme, and so on. I don't, I, don't, I don't think it's linear, right? Because you get this coupled system of <laughs> differential equations, so I don't think it's, it's linear. So in biological systems, that's exactly what happens. When the dictyostelium amoeba signals to other amoebas by secreting a pulse of cyclic AMP, which it does periodically, and another phase of the cycle it's a dresis of phosphodiesterase, which is your enzyme. A little bit later then. Yeah, a little bit yeah. later, yeah. Out, of, out of sequence. And that phosphodiesterase <coughs> diffuses more slowly, it has a different diffusion constant, yeah. um, but it cleans up the signal so that there is no intercivil interference. Yeah. And so, so you see these very nice uh, waves where the concentration goes up and the concentration goes back down. Yeah, yeah. so there may be more to it there. Yeah. Again, classical cell cycle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no idea because we I, I can you know I don't I, I don't know what the par I don't I don't remember what the parameters were right I mean well, you know, microsecond yes or... that much I know but the, we, I mean for the diffusion coefficients on we just use some um, just we used some typical values for you know <coughs> blood at uh, body temperature or something like this but I cannot. Right, because the flow that you see is normalized, right? So it's basically not, in the normalization, the diffusion coefficient uh, is in there. Right? So, uh, I'd just be curious what the time was. Yeah. 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 yeah, I can look it up, of course. Yeah. Yes? So you, you go back to slide number 32 where it shows 72, yeah. Yes. It, it looks like we are losing a tenor in with the design. So yeah. Yes. Yes. 
Yes, so actually, uh, this in some sense is, you know, optimizing the number of molecules you release is in some sense equivalent to adjusting the decision threshold, right? Sure, sure. And so we looked at that, but I, I, I can't remember how that, I mean, we looked at that later, right? After this work, we looked at that. So I, I mean, this is still beneficial. You can combine the two, right? So this is still beneficial, but I, I cannot remember which effect was. I, this effect was more pronounced, right? But you can do this, yeah. Yeah. Where you adaptively, you mean adaptively, you you change your uh, number of released molecules at the transmitter based on what you released before, right? Yeah. This is equivalent to changing the decision treasure. Yes. Go back to your uh, results. Yes. <coughs> Then in this case, uh, uh, the enzyme is uh, uh, without enzyme, the blue one, right? That's the yes, one I know what you want to ask, right? I had the same question, right? You, you want to ask why uh, is it with enzyme here still better than uh, with, right? Yeah, but I was surprised. I guess I could be surprised either, either way, but yeah, because I guess the one that you use the sequence detection, right? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. But maybe it's because the you know. I think the, the term distance is probably because this is not the return detector for the Euclidean distance, right? You have to take into account those metrics. So uh, probably the loss that you get in terms of distance from uh, basically the more endosome interference uh, is larger than the gain that you get by having more energy in the system without the enzymes, right? Because actually I had I expected that those two curves would be switched, right? So then we would get a better performance if we have the sequence estimate a better performance without enzymes because we have more energy in the system. More energy, yeah, yeah. Yes. So, um, and I don't have the I don't have analytical results for this, but I asked Adam many times <laughs> to check this, right? Because at the same, I know I was very surprised uh, as well by this. Yeah. But, Three hundred uh, nanometer is the distance, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And do you have the diffusion coefficient in there somewhere? No, not on this. But in the, I have the paper here, so I can just. Uh, is that blood? Yes, blood uh, uh, body temperature, something like this. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thanks. Thanks.